I am honored to welcome to Nobel Conference 57, Dr. Cynthia Rudin. Dr. Rudin is a leading researcher in the field of machine learning, a fast evolving technique for evaluating and making decisions and predictions with big data. One focus of Dr. Rudin's research and the focus of her talk today will be on the idea of black boxes in machine learning, whereby even the models for working with big data are incomprehensible to humans, either because of their complexity or due to trade secret. Seminal work done by Dr. Rudin has shown that in contrast to black box models, interpretable models, that is ones that can be understood by humans, can be just as powerful and accurate and indeed hold key advantages. In recognition of this and other work, Dr. Rudin has received many awards and fellowships. For example, she is the three-time winner of the INFORMS Innovative Applications in Analytics Award, was named one of the top 40 under 40 by Poets and Quants in 2015, and has been awarded fellowships in both the American Statistical Association and the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. Dr. Rudin earned undergraduate degrees in mathematical physics and music theory at SUNY Buffalo before earning her PhD in applied and computational mathematics at Princeton. She's now professor of computer science, electrical and computer engineering, biostatistics and bioinformatics, and statistical science at Duke University, and is the director of the Duke University Prediction Analysis Lab. Please help me welcome Dr. Cynthia Rudin. Hi, my name is Cynthia Rudin, and I'm going to talk about interpretable machine learning. I want to start off with a question, which is, can a typographical error lead to years of extra prison time? Right? This should never happen, right? Typos making decisions? That's crazy. You know, who's making a decision here, a judge or a typo? Um, and, and would it be fair if that happened? But it happens all the time. Uh, so here's a New York Times article about someone called Glenn Rodriguez, who was in prison since he was a kid. Uh, for many years and he comes up for parole. He's a model prisoner and he's denied parole because of a miscalculated compass score. Now compass is a black box proprietary model for predicting future crime and it is used in parole decisions. And he realized uh, after his parole was denied that one of the inputs into this compass score um, was its criminal history features that were actually, there was a typographical error in them. And so yes, you know, a typo made a decision here um, wasn't the, the parole board, it was, it was a typo that, that influenced the decision, and he got years of extra prison time. Now, Compass is a black box model, so let me tell you what, um, what a black box model is. It is a formula that's either too complicated for any human to understand or it's proprietary. Now, I want to contrast that with interpretable machine learning models. An interpretable machine learning model is a predictive model that obeys a domain-specific set of constraints so that humans can better understand it. So it's a predictive formula that a person can understand. Now, when do we need interpretable machine learning models? We need them for high-stakes decisions or when we need to be able to troubleshoot the model. Um, so this, these are useful for, like, you know, any time it would be really bad if, <laughs> if, the, if something went wrong. Um, so, for example, for criminal justice models, for predicting future crime, for credit scoring models that predict uh, default on a loan, for air pollution models that determine whether it's safe to go outside, airplane maintenance models for prioritizing airplane repairs, many, many healthcare applications. Anytime it would be really bad if an AI model, you know, an artificial intelligence model went wrong. Okay, so what else could, um, what else could go wrong if we use a black box? Well, this is an article about air quality during the wildfires of 2018. So uh, at that time, Google replaced the Environmental Protection Agency's Trustworthy Air Quality Index with a proprietary model from the company Breezometer, which told people it was safe to go outside on days when it was not. <laughs> and then this article over here is about how FDA approved deep learning models for detecting intracranial hemorrhages are not performing well, and no one knows why. And these are already FDA approved models. 
Okay, so this is just um, you know a few examples, a few things that have gone wrong with using black box models. But there's a tremendous amount more that could go wrong, and probably many things have gone wrong, but they were hidden so I don't know about them. And now people are starting to use machine learning for medical decision making, for loan decisions, self-driving cars, and for all matter of other things that we really don't want to go wrong. Now, I want to go back to Compass. Do we need, really need to have black box models? Are they more accurate? Now, luckily, um, there was a data set from Florida that was released that could tell us exactly how accurate Compass is for predicting who's going to be arrested in the future. Now remember, Compass is a proprietary model, so we don't have the formula, we just have its predictions. So we can compare them to predictions from interpretable machine learning models. So my lab did an experiment um, where we compared the quality of predictions from Compass to the latest machine learning method we had developed in the lab at the time, which is called Corals. Now Corals is certifiably optimal rule lists, and it's a very complicated algorithm but it produces very, very simple machine learning models that are interpretable and small enough that you can put them on a PowerPoint slide. So what we did was we took the Florida data and put it into Corals, and what it output was a machine learning model that looks like this. So it says, if the person's age is 19 or 20 years old and they're male, then predict arrest within two years of their compass score calculation. Else, if they're 21 or 22 years old and they have two to three prior offenses, then predict arrest within two years of their compass score calculation. Else, if they have more than three priors, prior offenses, predict arrest, otherwise predict no arrest. And we looked at this formula and we thought, could this possibly be as accurate as Compass, which has, a, you know, a much, m trained on much, much more data than, than Corals was? And it's such a simple formula that we got out, right? How, how, does it really stand a chance? And actually it did. So what I'm showing you are accuracy scores for Compass and Corals. And typically in machine learning, we, um, we use nine tenths of our data to train the model and the last tenth to test it. So um, what I'm showing you is out of sample accuracy on different subsets of the data that are in different colors. And as you can see, compass and corals are about equally accurate. And so we thought, okay, that's interesting. Well, let's try the whole arsenal of machine learning tools that we have at our disposal. Let's see if we could get any more accuracy on this problem. And surprisingly, they all performed about the same. And some of these methods produce very, very complicated models that you can't, you know, for complicated formulas that you could not fit on a PowerPoint slide. So uh, for example, you know, some of these methods um, would, would sort of, you know, create very complicated logical conditions that you, that you couldn't, you know, write out very easily. And some of them project data into an infinite dimensional space and then do computations there. So it's very complicated. Okay. So, um, and, you know, compare that to corals, whose whole formula is right on the bottom of the slide right there. Um, you know, that's, that's what we're seeing. Now, this is not, um, you know, the only data set where simple models perform well. In fact, there are actually many data sets where this kind of thing happens, where a simple model performs as well as the, you know, the best black box machine learning model that we can construct. And now, um, there is some subtlety in this statement uh, that, that I need to explain though. Okay, so there's really two broad kinds of problems that we encounter in machine learning. And, and, and in data science, there are problems with tabular data and problems with raw data. Tabular data look kind of like the criminal justice data that I just showed you. Uh, um, so um, it, they kind of look like this with different factors and you have uh, you know, different like, kind of questions and different answers to those questions. Um, whereas for raw data, raw data looks different. Raw data is like you know, images or sound waves or large amounts of text. Um, now, for these problems, for raw data problems, the only technique that's really working right now is neural networks. That's not, that doesn't mean the way that's always, that's always, that doesn't mean that's the way it's always going to be, but that's the way it is now. Um, and then it's very different though with tabular data. With tabular data, uh, as long as you as an analyst are willing to do some pre-processing of the data, all the machine learning methods 
generally tend to have very similar performance. And that includes methods that produce very, very small models, like the Quarles model that I showed you. So um, what that means is that um, we are able to get very small models for a lot of these tabular data problems that occur um, pretty commonly in criminal justice and healthcare, in the social sciences, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, while we're still working to develop, uh, for, for raw data, while we're still working to develop interpretable neural networks, which is definitely, you know, something we are, we're working heavily on, I won't get into those today, um, for uh, tabular data, there's really an opportunity to create these very, very small models that perform well. So, I want to ask you a question, which is, can interpretable machine learning models be used for trustworthy high-stakes decision-making? Now, I want to give you an example where that actually happens. And that's the example of predicting seizures in critically ill patients. So let's say that you have an aneurysm that bursts in your brain, and you have a hemorrhage in your brain, so it's like, kind of like a blood explosion in your brain, um, which is what that blue arrow is indicating there. And if you're in that state, you'd go to the hospital, get surgery, and then you'd go into the intensive care unit and you'd be monitored with monitors all over your head. These are EEG monitors. And those monitors are detecting signs of possible seizures. Now, seizures are common in these patients. These are subclinical seizures where the patient isn't shaking. They're just, they're, the, it's just only in the patient's brain. And these seizures are very dangerous. They cause brain damage. Um, they cause death. They're, they're very scary and doctors will do like everything they can to try to prevent um, patients from, from getting these seizures. They will um, maybe even shut down part of the patient's brain to prevent that from happening because of how dangerous these seizures are. Now, the only way to detect these seizures is through EEG monitors. However, um, there's a limited uh, resource. Uh, EEG monitors are a limited resource. There's not always enough uh, doctors and monitors to go around, and the monitors end up staying on people for way too long who don't need them, and then what that means is that people who need them may not get them. And so uh, it's really important to allocate these monitors carefully so that doctors can, can, help, um, can help prevent seizures. So I've been working with neurologists for many years, and we developed the two helps to be score uh, that predicts seizures from EEG uh, monitors. Now the two helps to be score I can put on a PowerPoint slide. Um, it, and it looks like this. So it's called two, two helps to be because it's two H, two, two hertz, and then E, L, P, S, then two points for the B, as you can kind of see with the bold lettering there. And then the doctor adds up the points, which translates into a risk of seizure um, and in, in the next six hours. Okay, now two helps to be. It looks like something that a doctor might have made up, but it's not. It wasn't created by doctors. It was created by data fed into a machine learning algorithm. This is actually a machine learning model. Um, it's just as accurate as the best black box models we could construct for this problem on the data set that we have. And um, the nice thing about two helps to be is that it doesn't force you to trust it. Doctors can decide themselves whether they want to trust it. And then also, um, doctors can calibrate the score with information not in the database. So if a doctor looks at a patient and they go, you know, there's something about this patient that's not in the database, I think that's that's something I need to add an extra point for, then they can go ahead and do that. Also, the score can be explained to non-physicians, so you can explain why someone is being taken off of EEG monitoring, for instance. Now, this, um, this predictive model has only six factors in it, but those factors were chosen by the machine learning algorithm from over 70 factors in a large database. And the point scores also, the one, 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 and two, um, those were also chosen by the machine learning model. Okay, so now um, what happens, now that we have two helps to be, is that the patient, um, you know, you come in with your, with your, with your um, aneurysm that bursts and your hemorrhage and you get monitored with the EG monitors. The doctors look at the EG signal and they say, your two helps to be scores three. You have this, this, and that, which means you're high risk and they're gonna place you on continuous EEG monitoring for at least 72 hours and start you on preventative medications. Now, so far, um, the two helps to be score has held up really well. Um, it was validated on an independent multi-center cohort, um, and I wasn't involved in this study. This was a, um, done by neurologists. 
And what you can see um, from this figure over here is that um, the predicted probability of seizure um, agrees with the true probability of seizure. Uh, for both the data set that we trained it on and the validation study. All right, um, it's been implemented in several hospitals, and so far it's resulted in a substantial reduction in the duration of EEG monitoring per patient, um, which allowed the doctors to monitor a huge amount more patients than before. They were able to monitor 2.82 times more patients than they could previously, which helps them reduce brain damage and save lives. And the whole reason why we could understand, why, why we could use this model is because we can understand it, because it's interpretable. Okay, so it's a rare example of machine learning actually being able to be used in high stakes decision making settings. Okay, so, but what about black box models? Now, it's much harder to get black box models into practice, and as I told you earlier, um, several of the FDA-approved black box deep learning models aren't performing well in practice, and we don't know why. And there's, like, there's a real appeal to black box models, right? People like them because there's a sense of mystery about them, right? They discover patterns that the human mind couldn't possibly understand, and people find that really intriguing. Um, however, when you try to use them, you realize immediately that these mysterious predictive models are not easy to work with. In particular, they're really hard to troubleshoot while you're designing them, because you, 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 you can't easily answer questions like, does the model often predict the right answer for the wrong reason? These models are hard to troubleshoot in practice, right? You, you, you can't tell immediately, will this model predict accurately for my current patient? Or could a typographical error in the inputs to this model have led to this prediction? Black box models are really hard to evaluate with respect to bias and fairness. Um, for instance, people have had a really hard time being able to evaluate whether compass is fair. You know, they want to know, does this model depend on a variable that I really don't want it to depend on, like a race, race variable? Black box models are also really hard to explain. Um, most explanations for black box models are either flawed or incomplete and they add unnecessary authority to the black box because you're trying to explain the black box predictions rather than replacing it with an interpretable model, which is almost always the better option. Black box models essentially turn computer-aided decisions into automated decisions. You're not aiding a human to make that decision. You're having the human trust the black box, which is very different. Now, a lot of people think that we need to sacrifice accuracy to gain interpretability, but that's not actually true. In fact, the opposite is true, where interpretability often leads to better accuracy. Because if you can understand what's going on, you can do a better job. <laughs> um, you can troubleshoot it more easily, and you can get an overall better system. Now, I want to give you an example of that, and it's actually um, a really important um, project for me because it's the first major project I ever worked on. Um, when I was at Columbia University working with Con Edison engineers on maintaining New York City's power grid. So this slide is like really old. This is like 14 years old. <laughs> anyway, so let me tell you what we were trying to do. Um, we, we, needed, we need to have a reliable energy grid, right? And we recognize that. And in New York City, the electrical infrastructure in many places is really old. And some parts of it are about 130 years old from when electrical grids were first introduced into the world. Um, New York's grid dates from 1882. It's the oldest power system in the world. These pictures are just as New York City was starting to put cables underground. And many of the cables from that time are still in the ground and functioning reliably. <laughs> so the grid is old, but um, not only is the grid old, it's really big. Um, in Manhattan, there's almost enough electrical cable to go all the way around the world. <laughs> and if you count all the boroughs of New York City, not just Manhattan, there's enough cable to go around the world three and a half times. And this is what I was supposed to be maintaining with machine learning. And this was my, you know, this was my first, first real job. So um, yeah, this was, this was um, a really big undertaking. And things were also changing in New York City. Um, the power company was changing from reactive maintenance to proactive maintenance. So proactive maintenance is where you use historical records of past failures to predict future ones and try to do the maintenance work before the failure happens, which is something new. Okay, so what's a failure? 
So a failure is a fire or an explosion or a smoking manhole. And these kinds of events are almost always due to insulation breakdown of the low voltage cable within the manholes. And being able to predict these events more accurately would have an impact on public safety, reliability of electrical service, and it could save the cost of repairing a lot of damage caused by um, an underground manhole event, like a fire and explosion. So the goal of my team was to use historical Con Edison data to rank the manholes in order of their vulnerability to serious events. Now, we had data from several different sources within Con Edison. We had data about the manholes themselves, like you know where they were located, um, what type of manhole it was, what the cover type was. We had six years of inspection reports filled out by inspectors. We had a snapshot of the, the electrical cable data, and we had past event data. And the past event data was over 150,000 Con Edison trouble tickets. So when someone experiences like flickering lights or their lights go out, um, they call a Con Edison dispatcher who starts typing in a trouble ticket for the event while they're directing the action. So let me show you what our event data looks like, looked like. <laughs> so it looked like, like that. Um, this is what a typical emergency control systems ticket looks like. These are actually our most important data because this is our event data and we're predicting events. And this is the, the ticket front over here, um, all the way on the, on the left there with, with the address and the date. Now, um, there's an important bit of information, which is the trouble type. Um, it says ACT, EDS, ACB. So that, that means ACB is the, the type. Um, ACB is, is AC burnout. Um, occasionally those are serious, but most of the time not. And then this document is the back of the trouble ticket, also called the remarks. And I know how to read the ticket now, so let me tell you what it says in my own words. Okay, so um, it says CIB Powers, whoever that is, reports that there's a contractor working in service box 158622 in front of 135 West 4th Street, has seven wire copper to the west duct, which means that there's an electrical cable that has melted itself onto the duct between the manholes. Um, and so they dispatched Manhattan District Engineer O'Hara, who arrives, and then he reports in that service box in front of 135 West 4th Street, has seven wire main in trouble going out the west wall. So he, he found, found the, the issue. Um, unable to tell if it goes west or south and the crossing is per the MNS plate. So what that means is he's looking at a, a little map of the three block region, the mains and service plate, um, and he can't figure out where that electrical cable goes because it's, it's, you know, it, it, just very difficult to get in there and figure out what's going on um, because there could be a lot of junk in the manhole and the cables melted so it's hard to figure out what is going on and the cables could look like you know spaghetti um, cables are supposed to be on these nice tidy racks over here um, like that but they don't always they don't always look like that um, sometimes they kind of get out and kind of look like like spaghetti anyway so um, he ordered a flush uh, in the manhole. So there's a flush truck that comes and sticks a big tube down into the manhole and sucks up all that gunk so we can get in there and figure out what's going on. Okay, so then um, he uh, uh, reported later that the flush truck was still working in the trouble hole. Uh, and then he reports that he uh, cut for replacement three 40 DC cables. So he cut some old electrical cables and four um, 40 AC cables from that service box to another service box. And then there's some parking information and so on. Right, so you could see how this was just a really, really hard problem. I mean, um, the database contained 140,000 trouble tickets just in Manhattan. Um, and of course it was very challenging to deal with all of this, like, you know, fragmentary language and misspellings and noise. Like here are examples of the, how the word barricaded was written. And there were at least 38 variations of how service box was written. And service box is an important term for us because a service box is a type of manhole. Anyway, so this is, you know, one of these problems that goes with, you know, discovering knowledge from diverse historical data. We had massive data integration and cleaning problems. It was really hard just to figure out which cables went into which manholes. We needed to have the domain expertise ourselves and be able to communicate with um, the domain, domain experts from the power company to be able to know what's in these databases. There were pockets of domain knowledge scattered in all different databases that we needed to really know what those databases were, what those fields were. Um, also, there was no real clear problem definition because we were supposed to be predicting manhole events, but a manhole event was defined by those trouble tickets. And the trouble tickets were really hard for us to read. 
Um, and what made, made it even worse is that at the time I was doing this, data science didn't exist as a field, so there was no like pipeline for doing this. So we designed our own pipeline uh, for, for um, solving this problem. And the way it worked is that all the data, the um, trouble tickets, the cable data, the inspection data, all went into a very careful data processing um, you know, pipeline. And it was all cleaned and put together in a big database. And then we would do machine learning on the data and try to rank the manholes in order of their probability to explode or have a fire the following year. And then we had a whole bunch of software tools that were designed to help us understand what we'd actually done. And we used that understanding to help us refine the process the next time around. And the better we understood what was going on, the better we could refine um, our next iteration of that process. So I'm just going to show you um, just like what one of the one, couple of the tools that we developed. So here's, a, for example, an overhead view of the, um, the predictions that we were making. Um, the, the lines are actually underground electrical cables. And then the little circles are actually manholes that are on the streets and avenues of the city. And uh, the color of the manhole indicates the probability or the, the ranking in our ranked list of how likely the manhole is to have an event the following year. So red is like really dark red, that's like more vulnerable and like lighter pink or white is less vulnerable. So you get a sense of how the density of the manholes is kind of covering the streets there. Anyway, so we had, um, we had Con Edison do a blind test evaluation of our whole pipeline um, where they tested us on events from 2009. And at the time our model was created from data through 2007 and 2008. So this is when I was working, back when I was working on this project. And the domain experts had handpicked 18 series events that happened in 2009 that were not in our database. And then we were supposed to check, well, where on our rank list did those, did those events uh, happen? Um, so there are 27,212 manholes in the Bronx and we'd ranked them by vulnerability, okay, using our whole process. And then for the 18 events, in 2009, um, I drew an arrow if the manhole had an explosion, an arrow with an X if the manhole had an explosion, and an arrow with an F if there was a fire. And so you could see that um, the manholes that um, had the events were often pretty much toward the top of our ranked list. Um, and so as you can see, um, if Con Edison had inspected the top 10% of manholes on our list, they could potentially have reduced the number of manhole events by up to um, 44, about 44%. And there were some manhole events that happened on manholes that were very low ranked on our list. And so, you know, what happened there? And it turned out that there was nothing in our database that could have indicated that those manholes were potentially vulnerable. The cables were more recent, um, the manholes had been inspected, there weren't that many cables in the manholes. It's just, there wasn't always perfect information in the database. All right, so the takeaway here is that um, we were sort of, you know, trying to get this all to work, but the thing that really allowed us to like get good accuracy is really being able to understand what our models were doing and being able to work with the domain experts to understand the data better. Okay, now how bad could it really be to use a black box model? And for this question, I want to go back to criminal recidivism prediction and, um, and the compass score. Okay, now we've already seen that typographical errors um, can cause problems with compass scores, and we've already seen that compass model doesn't seem to be more accurate than, than other um, interpretable models. Um, and I, I actually wrote a whole paper um, bef you know, back in 2017 on, on this, and saying that interpretable classification models are just as accurate as black box models. So that basically means there's not really any need to use um, a black box model. Um, and this paper then got into kind of a large argument about um, whether black box models are more accurate in criminal justice applications. Now, something I need you to know here is that explaining a black box is not the same thing at all as creating an interpretable model. If you create a model to approximate a black box, then it's an approximation, it's not an explanation. Because the black box, which might be this curvy thing, and the explanation, which might be the flat thing, um, might use different variables. Okay, so for instance, um, if, these, if the approximations, you know, it's approximately equal to the black box, um, 
It's possible that the approximation depends on age, number of priors, and race, whereas the black box only depends on age and number of prior crimes. And the inclusion of race here is, you know, that's, that's, that's very, that's different, right? And so um, you, could, you could accidentally, say, um, approximate a black box model with this approximation that depends on race and then conclude mistakenly that the black box depends on race. And you could say, well, nobody would do that, right? That's silly. Who would, who could, who would possibly make that mistake? But it's actually might happen. And it actually did happen. And it happened with compass in particular, someone approximated compass, um, and the approximation depended on race. And then they, um, concluded that compass depends explicitly on race in addition to age and the number in the criminal history. And the people who did that were from the ProPublica organization. And this is the, and this happened in the famous ProPublica article that everyone talks about. So, um, in this article, they made exactly this mistake. Um, they approximated compass with a linear model, depends on age, priors, and race, and then they concluded that um, compass depends on race in addition to age and number of priors. So let me just give you a little bit more detail about what happened there. So what ProPublica did was that they showed that the false positive rates and false negative rates of compass varied by race, okay? And then they realized that, wait, okay, that the, there might be a reason for that, and it might be due to sort of systemic problems with racism in society, okay? It might be due to the fact that the underlying populations have very different ages and very different criminal histories. So they said, you know what, maybe we shouldn't just do that, that comparison. We should actually condition on age and number of priors and re-examine, okay? So after they did that, they still found some dependence on race. They still found a linear approximation to compass with a low p-value for the race covariate. And then they concluded that compass depends explicitly on race in a way that's not through aged criminal history. And the problem here is that we don't think compass is actually a linear model. And so this conclusion doesn't actually follow. So um, let me show you some more details about that. So I'm going to take that Florida data set that I brought up at the beginning. And what I'm plotting here is um, this is a scatter plot of the compass scores. Compass violence score is a function of age. And each dot here is a person. And what you can hopefully see is that there's this like very clear, like lower bound um, of where, um, you know, it's like, it's almost like the minimum compass score for each age, right? That's what it looks like. Um, and, you know, maybe there were a few typos, which are in red over here, but essentially it looks kind of like compass um, depends heavily on age here. And age, this is not, you know, it's not a linear function of age. Like the, I don't see any line that I could really make that would, that would actually characterize that bottom curve there. And so, um, you know, if, if they messed up age in their approximation, that could definitely mess up their analysis. So what we did was we tried to take out that nonlinear function of age from compass and then check whether the remainder depended on race. And it really didn't seem to. Um, and in fact, we ran machine learning methods with and without race to see if they need race to predict compass well, and they didn't, they, they performed similarly. So we were wondering, well, then how did ProPublica come up with all these examples where they had like, you know, a white person and a black person where the white person had a low risk, but a really long criminal history, whereas the black person had a, you know, a high risk score from compass and a really um, low criminal history. Uh, and, you know, I think these examples, um, you know, uh, like they were using these examples to show that compass depends on race. But the thing is that these people are just very different ages. And, you know, if compass depends heavily on age, that could really explain how this happens, right? Vernon Prater is older, so he doesn't get the age points. And I'm not saying I agree with the way compass is constructed here, but if they had compared two people of the same age, it would be much more convincing that compass depends on race in addition to the strong dependence on age. Um, and so ProPublica's claims don't seem to really be holding up with respect to race. Compass might not, not actually depend on race um, in addition to age and criminal history. But I think there's a much worse problem with compass that ProPublica completely missed. And that problem is that humans are not very good at inputting data reliably which is what caused the issue with Glenn Rodriguez. 
you have 137 factors entered by hand for each compass survey, which means that even if there's a 1% error rate on that data entry, there's a 75% chance of at least one typo on a survey, which is a disadvantage, major disadvantage to complicated or proprietary models. And so um, basically, um, you know, this is exactly what happened with, with Glenn Rodriguez. So we were wondering how often this happens and um, so we looked at the Florida data to try to figure it out. And we found some really strange inconsistencies in the data. Uh, so this is, this is a bunch of uh, people we found in the, um, in the database that had the lowest possible compass violence score, but they had a fairly large um, number of prior crimes um, <laughs> associated with them. And some of these prior crimes were like violent crimes, like you know, battery on a law enforcement officer or attempted robbery with a deadly weapon or aggravated battery and so on. Um, and, you know, I just, I can't understand how it could possibly happen that these people would get the lowest possible compass score uh, given this, uh, given this, you know, given their criminal histories. And this is only the, you know, the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole lot more people. So here are people with compass scores of two and three with like, you know, large numbers of prior arrests and prior charges. Um, that really, you know, make, I can't explain this other than data errors. And then we even found what's possibly a typo, typo in the Compass documentation from the company that makes it called North Point. So the Compass documentation indicates that Compass is a linear function of age and age at first arrest. Um, and so we, we think actually that um, it, it's potentially true that um, there's a nonlinear relationship with age that I showed you with those curves. Anyway, so we published this article um, in the Harvard Data Science Review about these problems we found with Compass. And um, we got a number of responses to our article, including one response. And these, these responses, by the way, were from very famous criminologists and sociologists. Um, but one of the responses was actually from the company that made Compass. They actually responded to our article. And what they said was, that we've taken a clearly informal description of the compass violence score, um, which I think is funny because it's an equation, which is generally not really informal, right? I, I don't know how much more formal you can get than an equation. But anyway, they said that they noticed that, they note that the skewed age variable is an ideal candidate for a normalizing transformation. And we were like, what? So they're, you know, they're, they're, maybe there is a typo in the practitioner's guide to compass. And also, um, you know, they actually wrote down that they were actually pursuing copyrights for the general compass score and the violent compass score. And we were like, whoa, you know, maybe we actually, uh, uh, you know, maybe we actually help people understand that this is this transparency is actually important. So anyway, just to summarize, black box machine learning models are difficult to use in practice. For example, you know, there uh, seems to be a lot of typos in, in the compass score, or at least some data errors that we can't explain in other ways. Black box models are difficult to troubleshoot, like I showed you with the Con Edison example. They're difficult to explain, like ProPublica couldn't explain compass correctly. Um, it's also difficult to determine whether a black box model is fair. Again, um, the ProPublica compass um, situation is an example of that. Um, and interestingly, interpretable models tend to be just as accurate if you design them carefully. And I give you three examples of that, recidivism prediction, seizure prediction in intensive care unit patients, and um, predicting manhole events on the New York City power grid. And um, interpretable models, they allow computer-aided decisions and not automated decisions. All right, thank you very much. Welcome back. Um, I'm here again with Jesse Patrika of the Department of Physics uh, to talk a little bit about what we just heard. So a reminder, if you would like to ask a question about Professor Rudin's presentation or indeed any of the presentations that um, you've heard so far, you can send those to nobelconference at gustavus.edu. No capital letters needed. Uh, we're opening a poll now. So if you'd like to participate in our purely unscientific poll uh, that will not be interpretable with any model, I'm sure. Uh, please go ahead uh, to pollev, that's P-O-L-L-E-V, dot com 
slash Nobel 57, polev.com slash Nobel 57. Or you can text Nobel 57 to the number 22333 and text in your answer to the poll there. And those are just an interesting way to, to hear how the talk sort of landed on people's ears. So, um, Jesse, um, <laughs> if an interpretable model is such a simple thing to look at, couldn't a human come up with it on their own? Yes, and, and they certainly could. Um, but an interpretable model made by a machine learning program um, takes into account many, many more inputs and looks at the patterns inside the data um, that a person um, may or may not have access to. So using that machine learning model, uh, it's a computer-aided decision with the enhancement of the big data um, that a, a practitioner, um, you know, even with their years of experience, may not have, have had the time to go through that terabyte and terabytes of data. So when I tried to think about what this looked like, it's that uh, there actually is a thread that could be followed through this terabyte of data. And again, we all are trying to visualize a terabyte somehow. Uh, and, and a machine can, through multiple iterations, come to find that thread, whereas the, the monkeys typing Shakespeare are gonna take a long time, that is, uh, any, finite number of humans isn't going to be able to detect that pattern, even though the pattern that's found might end up being very simple. Do I have it right? That sounds right. Um, and the best part about the interpretable model is that the practitioner can, can use that model um, in, a, in a way that aids their decisions. So depending on what the model is, Maybe something in the model doesn't apply to the person. Um, and so I, I give this example about, you know, maybe your family history is an important part of the interpretable model, um, but, but maybe I'm adopted and my family history really shouldn't be um, part of that decision-making process. And so someone that's using an interpretable model will be able to see whether that piece is important for, for that person, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so she really emphasized that, for instance, a doctor can look at the, what was it, um, helps, helps to be, two helps to helps be, to be. Uh, and sort of carry it around in their white coat pocket and look at it and say, okay, they get three points for this, five points for this, one point for this. Oh, they don't have any of that category. I guess we won't take any points, but oh, look, they actually have this other thing that, that we didn't know. That makes sense. And it also shows the deeply contextual nature of interpretability, right? Am I, am I right that, in other words, maybe you and I wouldn't be able to understand the model that the, uh, that the stroke doctor is using uh, precisely because we're not, we don't understand why those might even be factors. I mean, I guess maybe what I, maybe I actually have a question there, Jesse, and that is, what's the degree to which when we say interpretable, a doctor has to look at that and say, well, of course their you know, blood pressure would matter, or of course age would matter, or of course prior episodes would matter. Whereas I might look at that and say, why is eye color relevant here? I mean, is that a, is that a layer of what's involved in interpretable? I'm sorry, I'm kind of getting down in the weeds here, but it feels like Absolutely. this is one of those. Yeah, and um, you know, the, one of the key selling points of interpretability is to be able to use that model in order to refine that model, to make sure that model can be um, better. And you know, a doctor can say, hey, eye color isn't important in this decision, and why is that showing up? And we can refine our model to make sure that the model um, is, is doing the things that we want for the reasons that we want them. And so that's one of the key selling points of in interpretability um, is to, to be able to see that and be able to have that feedback loop. That was one of the slides shown in this talk. You know, the feedback loop certainly isn't possible with a, a black box 
type of a model. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, that, that notion of a black box, and Dr. Rudin emphasized two ways that something can be a black box. One is that the, the list of steps you couldn't fit on any index card in the universe, or all the index cards in the universe, maybe. Uh, and then the other way is uh, if it's proprietary, if it's actually owned by a company. So if an interpretable model is so simple, um, then... Um, what does that do to ownership of models? For instance, the company that developed Compass mentioned a patent when they responded in that, you know, in that letter they wrote to Dr. Rudin and her team. So um, how does interpretability intersect or not intersect with um, ownership of models? That's a, that's a very key question. I think that's something that um, is open. I think that's something that got touched on in the, the lectures and in the panels yesterday. Um, who is making those decisions? Um, is that up to the courts to make those decisions? Um, that's something that's certainly um, unanswered at this point. I do think that you know, whether you're able to explain your model or not should be uh, taken into account whether you get a patent for that model. Here, this is something that I don't know what's going on. Uh, please give me a patent for it. Um, or maybe on the flip side, um, this is an interpretable model, and the interpretable model is so simple that, yes, any doctor could have come up with it, but now I'm going to patent that model, um, and maybe I have a patent and someone else has to pay licensing fees or something. These are open questions mm -hmm. um, that are really important going forward with the machine learning community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, an analogy that one of the other panelists used at one point was we don't actually expect um, the technician, or maybe even any person, any individual person working on the development of the MRI machine to understand an MRI machine in its entirety. Um, is that a good analogy for um, the, the issue with machine learning models, or, or is where does the disanalogy come in, Jesse? Do you know what I mean? So, like, I don't expect the technician to know what's going on when I'm in that, when, when I have my head in that incredibly loud thing that's doing something. Why are they so loud also? That's another question we all want to know. But at any rate, um, is that analogy analogous or is that disanalogous? No, I, I think there is a, a connection there. And one of the things that um, came up yesterday, both in the, the panels and with the, the discussions that our, our um, oh, yeah. professors had with those. the students, is that, um, look, if you have uh, a machine learning model that's making important decisions, high stakes decisions, you want to be able to know um, what's going on with that model. And then one of the reasons for interpretability is because if it, if it goes wrong, you want to know why it goes wrong. Um, and then on the flip side, when you're using that machine learning model, especially for high stakes decisions, um, the person using that model should have some sort of training to understand what's going on in the model. Mm -hmm. So it's not just uh, the fact that you're, you're building these models and you need to be able to train in order to be able to build these models. For high stakes decisions, even with interpretive models, even with machine learning, you should have some sort of training to understand what's going on in the model in order to be able to help guide your decision making because an interpretive model is still a, a way to aid your decision. It's still a device to aid your decision. Yeah, great. So you mentioned those discussions. You want to tell us a little bit about what happened? So our, our Gustava students had exclusive access to our, our presenters yesterday afternoon. Uh, they, they joined the conversations in pairs, our presenters did. So you were in one with, uh, with uh, Professor Rudin and Professor Osorio, That's I right. believe. So can you tell us a little bit about what that discussion was like? So that discussion, um, we had about 16 students, plus or minus, and it was, a, it was a really wonderful discussion where the students got to interact with the professors. It's one of the wonderful things about Nobel Conference. You know, you get to interact with these people in myriad different ways. You hear their talks, you hear the panel discussions, but our students yesterday got a chance to interact with the professors um, themselves. And some of these ideas about, you know, where are the important questions about bias, where are the important questions about interpretability, um, and where are the important questions, you know, the future of the field, um, they got to ask those questions one-on-one. -on -one. It was also really nice to see that our students got to ask uh, our presenters you know, some, something about their background, how they got into what they were doing, and um, you know, what made them interested in the data science field, um, getting into big data and, and machine learning with um, Dr. Rudin, um, you know, the law and ethics with um, Pilar Rosario, right? so that, that was a lot of fun.
Mm-hmm. Neat. Neat. Um, so I think, I, I, I feel like I'm obsessed with interpretability here in the question of it, but I guess that's appropriate given that uh, it's exactly the most important thing for Dr. Rudin in her work. So I guess we, I'm going to just keep talking about it, Jesse. Um, so she, um, uh, says, empirically, we know that black box models don't perform any better. Is that, an, is that purely an empirical thing? That is, is it, well, so far, every single instance we've taken, every single model we've looked at, we've been able to produce one or someone has been able to produce an, an interpretable model that works as well as this um, secret code. Is, or is that an in-principle thing? Do we know? Can we know? whether that's just in practice or is, or is actually, like, can we, can we write a formula <laughs> that, that right. tells us why it's always the case? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great question. And it's something that I think people in the field would love to be able to prove. Um, and certainly Dr. Rudin's work, um, you know, is moving in that direction. Love to be able to prove that interpretable models are just as good as black boxes in every single way. Um, you know, certainly the evidence points that every time uh, Dr. Rudin goes and tackles a problem in very disparate fields, whether it's healthcare, NASCAR driving, uh, manholes and, and fires, uh, that, yeah, lo and behold, we can make an interpretable mm -hmm. model that is just as good as the black box model. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, do we have to do that on a case-by-case -case basis? No one knows yet, but it's certainly everything that we've tried, um, we, we can do. So that's that's a great thing, and, and one of, the things that uh, Dr. Rudin has been saying is that we can do it essentially for free. If we build the interpretable model, we can show you that that interpretable model is just as good as the black box model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you touched on another thing that um, has been really interesting about, about uh, Professor Rudin's work and her and her team's work, which is when you're a data scientist, boy, you just have to go all over the place. I mean, she makes the point that, right, this started as, uh, recommendations to me about which brand of cowboy boots I should buy next, right? But I, that is, ex as she says, extremely low stakes um, decisions. Uh, and sh but she is saying that look, we can use these interpretable models in in literal life and death circumstances. And you pointed to just some of her work. I mean, what's it like to try to be a data scientist? How do you do that work responsibly, given that you are constantly? I think uh, Jillian Hiscock said. Uh, oh, Jillian uh, Downey said, you have to kind of go all over the place and be a little bit of everything. Well, I think it goes back to what you were talking about with Tom and Carl right before this lecture, um, the ability to collaborate and to communicate with other people of different fields. So um, Tom and his example of going off on sabbatical and, and being the mathematician, he's got the data scientists, you've got the computer scientists, you've got the machine learning experts, but you also have the domain experts. You have the healthcare experts, you have the the electrical engineers in the manhole case, right? So the ability to be able to talk with those people, work with those people, is part of the ethics, is part of doing your job correctly and getting the job done right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, us being able to do the communication um, is an important part of being a responsible scientist, being a responsible data scientist, um, and, and knowing those ethics and working with those people. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to switch quickly to the poll and just take a minute to take a look at that. So again, uh, if you haven't had a chance to s respond to the poll, it is pollev.com slash Nobel57. And the question that we asked in the poll was, uh, Professor Rudin advocates for machine learning algorithms. However, individuals are almost un always unaware when a model, ha a method has been used to make a decision. Uh, when your personal data is used by a machine learning algorithm, you should never be informed, only be informed if it affects you, be informed whenever a decision impacts you, or always be informed whether or not it impacts you. So what are you seeing there, Jesse? Anything that hold, that, uh, that strikes you as interesting? Well, certainly the, the answers for C&D, be informed or always be informed, um, are, are the clear winners in this case. <laughs> um, I think that as we heard from the panel discussions yesterday, that these decisions are being made all the time, um, and you are very clearly not necessarily being informed. So, you know, maybe that begs for uh, more regulation, maybe that begs for more um, consent for people to be 
informed, but these decisions are being made by machine learning, learn, machine learning models all the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we probably should be informed more often than we are, uh, given the amount of impact it's having on our lives. But you maybe are saying always be informed might be a, a bridge that we don't actually want to cross, uh, that we might actually find ourselves deluged with information that we then tune out. It could be, you know, every time that you interact with something, there's just yet another checkbox or just yet another warning. Say, hey, mm -hmm. machine learning is, is affecting this decision and you need to know. And so, yes, that could be part of um, what's going on there. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jesse, thanks very much for this discussion. It was really interesting to think a little bit more about interpretable models with you.